Hello viewers, my name is Martin Caballero. I'm a senior reporter with BevNet, and I'm here at the 2017 KombuchaCon in Long Beach, California. Very pleased to be joined by Mr. Sai Chalawadi, the Executive Vice President of Research and Development and Operations at Pure Steeps. And of course, you're here representing the uh, Wonder Drink Kombucha brand. Uh, how are things going so far for you? Uh, it's been great. Uh, it's, a, it's been a great uh, you know, a morning, and uh, um, for Wonder Drink, this year is going to be huge, and uh, we're excited to be here. Yeah, it's great. It's great to see you again. I know we uh, caught up a little bit at the Fancy Food Fest in, um, or Fancy Food Show in San Francisco a couple weeks ago, and I had a chance to talk a little bit about sort of your background, and really interesting that you're pursuing a PhD in kombucha. That's so right. Sort of tell me about what that entails, and sort of what was the idea behind you pursuing that? Well, I've, I have a master's degree in uh, food science, and uh, my focus has been on probiotic research uh, for over, uh, I guess, at 10 years now. And uh, kombucha has been, you know, one of the fastest growing categories uh, when I just got out of school. And uh, that intrigued me. And fermented foods has always been my passion. Um, so it was a natural progression for me to look at kombucha. And I've also seen a need for real science to uh, come out of kombucha research. And there's not a lot of published research out there uh, when I started this uh, PhD. Um, so that's the real motivation. Right, clearly, um, you know, science is, is a huge part of, of kombucha and sort of formulation and everything, and also in dealing with the regulations that have come about. So sort of what are the, some of the biggest challenges from that side in terms of in, interpreting and understanding the science of kombucha that really translates into issues for consumers and, 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 and in the industry? I mean, kombucha industry is a vibrant industry. Uh, it has shown the food industry that uh, food can be more than sugar and salty types of foods and beverages, uh, for that matter. So it's been a grassroots movement. Um, and the size of the category now being 400 million uh, retail sales, and I think the whole size of the category is about 800 million, uh, which is incredible. Um, so all this had happened because of people outside the industry uh, stepping into the industry and trying to make uh, a change in terms of offering uh, healthy beverages to the consumers. Um, but we've reached a point where um, we need to include science uh, to alleviate some of the concerns um, and open it up to uh, the food industry and the beverage industry uh, be more open um, to change. So obviously in kombucha you mentioned sugar. I mean that's one of the big issues in terms of reporting on the label. There's been multiple studies that have sort of uh, suggested that um, that is being underreported. Sort of what's your take on that issue and, and how can that finally be sorted out in a way that works for all brands in this category? I think it's one of those things, it's an open secret. Um, everyone's aware of the issue. Uh, but the challenge is, is, is science, do we use science or do we use regulations uh, to solve this issue? And I would say as a scientist, science is the way to go. Um, because regulations can only take you so far. And the real intent of regulations is to uh, protect consumer interests. Um, and if the consumer interests are not protected and it's about safeguarding the industry, it will only take us so far. Um, so it's about using real scientific tools to manage the issue. So, okay, so we have the scientific tools, or, or say for example that we do, how do you sort of bring other brands and sort of bring the, the entire kombucha category into sort of agreement um, that this was uh, a valid way to, to proceed on that issue? It, it's an interesting question, intriguing question, it's a challenge. Uh, the way I look at this is, I look at the yogurt industry for example. Right? Yogurt industry went through a similar cycle uh, in the last 20 years. Um, you know, the issue of, uh, when we were looking at the categories of functional beverages about six years ago, our parent company, Harris Freeman, this was even before Pure Steeps, even before Wonder Drink Kombucha as part of a portfolio. Um, we were intrigued by the yogurt category. And we've done consumer research to see what is the driver behind consumers, new consumers buying yogurt products. And in, one of the top two reasons was for probiotic benefits of yogurt. Uh, what was interesting back then is there are only a handful of brands that were adding probiotics to yogurts. And rest of the brands were piggybacking on that consumer awareness or lack thereof. Um, so, in many ways, kombucha industry is following the same pathway, so I'm quite positive and encouraged that uh, there will be a change in the kombucha industry. Um, if you look at the yogurt industry right now, there's clear differentiation of types of yogurts. Uh, you have probiotic yogurts, you have Greek yogurts for protein, um, and then you have fun yogurts, which, which are all about great taste and great quality. Um, so, 
I think the consumers have more use cases for yogurt than they did six years ago or ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think kombucha industry also will evolve into multiple categories. Uh, it could be alcoholic, non-alcoholic, probiotic, prebiotic, you know, just fun, cool brands uh, which, which are all about great taste. Um, and, I, and I think that that's a natural progression for the kombucha industry. And as long as we all work together, meet often, um, and talk about each other's efforts and uh, what everyone else is doing, I think we'll naturally get there. Um, and it's one of those things you cannot force um, on the industry. Uh, because the size of the industry is one thing, but also you have to think about the roots of the industry. Uh, it, it has started as a mom and pop, as a hobby, as a passion, um, and applying the principles of food industry on kombucha industry may not take this industry too far. Sure. Well, I'm glad you brought up uh, probiotics and, and prebiotics because that is uh, one thing that's uh, sort of distinguishing about the Wonder Drink brand. Um, can you sort of you know, that's something that we're still learning about. Can you sort of explain why you guys decided to go with prebiotics? You know, what difference that makes to the consumer and how they feel? Right. Um, the Kombucha Wonder Drink brand uh, is one of the earliest brands in the kombucha category. It's about 16 years old. The founders of the brand had a choice. Uh, there were four co-founders, and one of the founder was co-founder was a biologist. Um, and he had a choice to go down the route of fermenting the tea um, and selling it as a raw product or fermenting the tea like how you ferment kombucha, pasteurize and then sell it as a safe compliant product. And they've taken that later approach and the brand had stuck with that approach for the last 16 years. The same flavor, same identity. Um, it has uh, developed a great brand identity. It's, it's in 11 countries um, and uh, the brand equity is quite strong for kombucha wonder drink. And it's a, after the acquisition, uh, during the process itself we were thinking about ways to take Wonder Drink brand to the next level and resonate uh, with the current consumer, uh, make, make it more contemporary. And uh, the natural choice for, was for us, we, we did not want to compromise on the core uh, principles of the brand, which is about safety and compliance. So the product is a pasteurized product, um, but we ferment it. And how do we communicate that to a consumer that they're not losing any health benefits? So based on my research, extensively looking at different brands and you know, kombucha making process, um, the real benefits of kombucha are twofold. Uh, they have tea polyphenols and uh, you know, the vinegar. Vinegar is the acetic acid. Mm. Um, so there are no naturally occurring probiotics in the kombucha fermentation process. It's, it's like how you ferment milk. So there's no naturally occurring okay. probiotics in the fermentation process. Right. And the challenge with that is there is no definition of what is probiotic, at least supported by a regulatory authority. Um, so it's open for interpretation and that's where um, you know, th there is a chance for alternative facts and pseudoscience to take over. Um, so probiotics are healthy microorganisms that give you a real health benefit. Right? Uh, kombucha system is acidic. Um, it cannot support the growth of probiotic organisms. You can always add probiotics after the fact, but during the fermentation process itself, the probiotics will not thrive in so, that environment. So we're saying that, you're basically saying that any um, kombucha on the market does not include any sort of natural probiotics. It's all going to be added probiotics. The ones that uh, declare probiotics on the ingredient statements are the ones that are adding after fermentation. Um, and then it, it's the same story as what yogurt industry went through. There are brands that added probiotics to the yogurt, making them probiotic. And I think the kombucha industry is going through a similar story right now. Sure. Well, that's why it's great to have your the scientific perspective on this. It's very interesting stuff. I also want to touch a little bit, too, about uh, obviously I'm holding the glass bottle here, but you guys um, have done a can, uh, shelf stable. Just sort of tell me about the idea behind uh, of getting that in, in cans and sort of how that affects your sales and distribution strategy. Why does that work for you? Uh, we've always had both bottles and cans, the same flavors in two uh, offerings, two sizes. And it, it cans, having it in cans is uh, very good for our merchandising. Um, we have uh, online sales. Uh, we are in many retailers with cans. Uh, so it just opens up new consumers for us, convenience stores, for example, food service operators. Uh, and there are some avenues where glass can be a challenge. Uh, we export a lot of our product, uh, like I said, to 11 countries. Uh, so it gives us flexibility and more options to work with. How is science going to lead the next innovations? Like, What can we expect to see coming in terms of innovations that are sort of grounded in the uh, science and research that you mentioned? Right. I, I think the science... Um, 
Innovation for the sake of innovation, um, we've always thought about it, sake of innovation is um, pointless, right? Uh, but it so happens that kombucha industry is in a need uh, for innovation, uh, be it uh, how do you scale kombucha manufacturing, um, how do you uh, communicate or uh, evaluate the health benefits and communicate that. Um, so these are real questions to be solved and I think science will play a major role um, in, in answering those questions. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time, Sai. I hope you enjoy the rest of your, your time here, and uh, we we'll hope to talk again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Marty.